This is Daddy Show. Step off. Hey, hey, what is up? Welcome to the program. Thank you for tuning in. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Tom Clark, and you are listening to Tom Clark's main event. For those of you who have tuned into the broadcast before, for those of you who follow my writing online, I must extend, of course, the customary laurel and a hearty handshake. Thank you for your support. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for always being there. Thank you for being the wind beneath my wings. <laughs> Can I just be honest with you? I've missed being full of crap here. Uh, this is episode nine of the podcast, and yes, it's been a month. Please don't hate me for it. I've been a busy guy. What can I say? I've been busy churning out articles for you to read and, and perhaps love or maybe even criticize and maybe... You know, send hate mail about, but whatever the case may be, that's what I've been doing. And you know, the holiday season is upon us, and I, like many of you out there, are busy, you know, stuffing stockings with coal and whatnot and all that good stuff. So I can't be too much of a Grinch, folks. I have a six year old, and he's all about it. So as long as he's all about it, I'm all about it. You know what I mean? So <laughs> let's go ahead and get right down to business, folks. Uh, again, this is episode nine. We're going to get the ball rolling and get started here. Uh, as of right now, this time, the main event, the end of the authority. That's right, folks. You know them. You hate them. You may even detest them a little bit. But the authority, we're talking about the top corporate heel faction in WWE, led, of course, by the game Triple H and his wife, the boss's daughter, Stephanie McMahon. Let's just call it for what it is. The end of the authority is looming. It's on the horizon. Why is that? Because Survivor Series is coming up on November 23rd. And that will more than likely be Armageddon for the authority. It will be the end game for the game, as it were. And let's be honest, folks. It probably couldn't come sooner for a lot of fans. Why is that? The company's top storyline could be ending. And... If we're doing the math correctly, we're looking at around uh, 14 to 15 months this thing's been going on. Top storyline of the company. It's a long time for something to be going on in that company, of course. But it's a storyline that's both captivated and dominated WWE program. And let's be honest. You can't tune in into Raw. You can't tune in to SmackDown. You can't watch pay-per-view. You can't go online. You can't pick up anything that's got any sort of WWE material related to it. Without seeing Triple H and Stephanie McMahon, the authority has run the entire show. Okay? That's just reality. So how's it been? How you been feeling about the authority? What's been your reaction as a fan? How do fans overall really feel about the authority? And I'll do you one better. What's the authority's primary purpose for existence in the first place? Can we just get that one out of the way right now before we go any further here, folks? What is the primary reason the authority was together to begin with? Because it may not be the reason that we've seen the past out of factions. What exactly are we talking about here, folks? Let's think about this for a second. Try to get your head around this. Most of the time, a faction's reason for existing is to produce new stars, to get new talent out there. From the Four Horsemen to Evolution, factions are a great way to get new faces, fresh faces in front of the crowd, to test them out in front of a live audience, in front of the audience at home, to see if they can get traction with the fans. If they can get over, then the company has produced new stars, and new stars equals more money. More money in the pocket of the company is a good thing. Okay? A company has to evolve. It has to keep going in order to move forward. New stars ensures that the future is secure, or at least there's a better chance of that future becoming a reality. 
Can we all agree on that? Think about the Horseman. It produced Lex Luger. For better or worse, it produced Lex Luger, okay? But it also produced Barry Windham. Fans knew that Barry was talented. Everyone knew that Barry was talented. When Barry turned heel, he thrived, man. He was completely in his element. No one saw that coming because Barry had been such a babyface for so long. Great hand in the ring, very talented, great babyface. Good-looking guy, young, had the long hair, had the body, had everything that it took to make the crowd love him, and they did love him. Second-generation wrestler, the son of the legendary Black Jack Mulligan. I mean, there was every reason to believe that Barry Wyndham would be like Ricky Steamboat, be a face for life. But the moment that he turned him, put those four fingers up, and the weeks that followed, fans got a true sight, a true glimpse into the talent that Barry Wyndham possessed. The horsemen got him over as a heel. They produced a new talent that suddenly went from being a great hand in the ring to being a future Hall of Famer. I mean, that's the difference that the horsemen made for Barry Wyndham. Okay? Tully was good on his own. Arn was excellent on his own. Rick was the champ. Put them all together, they're legendary. They're unstoppable. Okay? Because a good faction, a good faction produces new talent, produces new stars. Good faction. Notice I didn't mention the NWO. Because NWO wasn't that good of a faction. They were in the beginning. The first six months, they were lights out the best faction in the industry, by far. Sold a lot of merchandise. Got a lot of ratings, produced zero stars. Because their top four guys, top three guys, were already stars. You know, Hogan, Savage was there, but we're talking about, of course, Hogan, Holland, Nash. And then Savage comes in, the plethora of former WWF, WWE stars and legends and future Hall of Famers coming in left and right. That's not producing new stars. Okay, that's the NWO using stars that were already there. Made men. Guys that were already there. Okay, they were just brought in. What new stars did the NWO produce? Can you name one? Seriously, take a minute and think about it. Can you name one new star? They had a handful of guys. Buff. Okay, fine. Buff and I guess maybe Scott. Scotty Steiner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. If you want to produce, if you want to say the two were produced by the NWO, fine. But I'm talking about the faction as a whole. Their purpose for being the NWO's purpose for being was to make money. Okay, was to get ratings, not to necessarily produce new talent. It's a good thing they didn't really do it. Okay, but great factions. That's what they're capable of. Are taking guys that maybe you didn't think that much of, of to begin with. And putting them in your face and give them opportunity to shine. And then suddenly you say, hey, not bad. Look at the acolytes. The corporate ministry. Okay? Well, the ministry, right? Uh, Bradshaw and Farouk. Everyone knew what a great hand Farouk was. Former WCW World Heavyweight Champion. Everyone knew it, what JBL was capable of. But, you know, they're there. They're kind of not doing anything. Put them in a tag team. Suddenly, they're the modern day road warriors. I mean, think about that. Suddenly, they got over in a very, very big way, the APA. The Acolytes become the APA. They take off from there. So even the ministry was able to introduce, well, not introduce, but, you know, put a spin, a new spin on older talent and get them back out in front of the camera. Okay? So the best faction in the history of the best, we, we, miss, we mentioned Evolution. Again, Triple H's entity. But think about that. Evolution produced Batista and Randy Orton. Okay? It wasn't just about Flair and Hunter. It was about the future as well. So, I submit to you the question. Because you know where I'm heading with this, right? You guys are on board with me, right? You know where I'm going with this. The authority's primary purpose for existence. What new stars has the authority created? You got an answer for me? I'm waiting. I'm all ears. I'll give you a minute. Go ahead. Sit there and discuss. Okay. Let's see what you can come to as a group, and then go ahead and get back to me. While you're discussing, let me throw this out at you. What is the purpose of this faction in the first place, if not to create new stars? I got one guy. One guy. Primary guy. Number one guy of, of all of them that you could possibly mention to me right now. If he wasn't the first name that you mentioned, shame on you, because if he wasn't, you're wrong. Daniel Bryan. Brian's rise to the top of WWE came through the authority. They were the group that facilitated Brian coming to his own in the first place. 
seizing the brass ring and finally achieving his goals, the authority versus Daniel Bryan was basically Vince McMahon versus Stone Cold. Only it took an ensemble of personalities in order to keep propelling Bryan upward. Okay, because the talk started very early on about Brian's too small. He's not what they're looking for. He's physically not the type. He doesn't really have that much charisma. He doesn't really have that much of a personality. Uh, he's excellent in the ring, but it, is he sort of, uh, you know, so that smaller guy that may or may not actually get there, like a smaller Shawn Michaels. Like he's very good, but he doesn't have charisma like Shawn had. Okay, that talk was already there. Can I be straight with you? I was the guy that said it. I was, and I'm a big Brian fan. I was when they brought him on board, but I knew what that company was looking for, and I knew that if he was going to be successful, he had to find his hook. He had to find a hook. He found the hook next to Kane. He started finding it with AJ. He really came into his own against and with Kane. The whole neurotic side of his personality as it became, began coming to light, and it was exposed, and he was... Uh, you know, everything was, everybody's was working against him. He didn't trust anybody. What the funny thing that happened with all that, he's became fearless. He wouldn't back down from anyone. He got in Kane's face. Who does that? <sighs> Who does that, right? Out of respect to Kane's character, no one does that, really. Brian was one of the first, maybe not the first, but one of the guys that, that of that physical size to jump straight up, bump chest with Kane and say, come on, big man, let's do this. He wasn't scared. Why? Because his neurotic personality his obsessiveness about who he was and his character and all that stuff far outweighed any fear he may have had by working Kane. That stuff didn't matter to him. He looked at Kane as being a nuisance, as being somebody that was, you know, always trying to second guess him. Kane was just like anyone else. He wasn't a monster from hell. He was just some big dude in his way. That's all he was. So hence there was no fear with Daniel Bryan. So that's when fans truly started to see, hey, wait a minute, Bryan's starting to catch on. I think there might be something there, and I saw it. I saw it with AJ, but I really saw it the first time he had an interaction with Kane. I said, wait a minute. This this has possibility of getting some traction, man. This has possibility of getting over, okay? And of course it did. It got over in a very big way, but ask yourself a question here, folks. Without the authority, without the authority, would Brian have risen to the heights that he got to? Think about that. As I said just now, uh, with Austin, it was McMahon versus Austin, and other characters were brought into the storyline. With the authority versus Daniel Bryan, it was the authority versus Bryan, and more characters were layered on top. Okay, It wasn't just one guy. It wasn't Hunter by himself saying, you're not worthy. It was Hunter, it was Stephanie, it was Vince, it was Randy Orton, it was Kane, it was everyone they could possibly throw in Daniel Bryan's way. And Bryan had his critics at the time, I'm sure he did. You know, fans, I'm going to be straight with you for a second here, man. Fans appreciate talent, they do, but some fans don't care about talent. Okay, you want to know how I know? Because you watch a great wrestling match on Raw and people are chanting boring. Nah. <laughs> And it's a good match. It's a good match, okay? But they're chanting boy because they don't care. Because there's no flash. There's no pizzazz, man. People want fireworks. You know what I'm saying? They want, you know, power bomb off the top rope. I mean, it's not as bad as it used to be with ECW and all that crap. But, you know, they, they want that high impact, you know, the high spots, the personality, the charisma. And they don't, they weren't really getting that with Brian. But here's the funny thing that happened, man. Not only did his character begin to evolve, but his work in the ring started getting him over because the more fans watched him, the more they realized we, we can no longer ignore this guy. This guy is lights out awesome in the ring. That became his saving grace. That's what kept him with the job, in my opinion, because if Brian's skills had ever diminished, if Brian did not catch on with the crowd in terms of his matches and his ring ability, then I'm going to tell you something right now. I doubt he would have had a future in WWE because the charisma was not there. The character was not there. He had to find his niche. Now, he found it, but it took a while, okay? But we basically saw the evolution of Daniel Bryan as he was facing off against the authority. It's the truth, man. I mean, we saw the evolution of Daniel Bryan. We saw the talent that Daniel Bryan had and how good he could be, what he was capable of, as he began his rivalry, his feud, his heat, whatever you want to call it, with the authority, okay? He was the top talent. He was to be maybe not the next top guy, but another top guy, 
because that company needs more than just Cena. Can we be honest? And no disrespect intended to Cena, please don't light the torches and come, you know, uh, uh, storming the castle and trying to take yours truly out and dump me in tar or whatever you medieval people like to do with yourselves all day long. I, so I'm, not, I'm not taking shots, but that company needs more than John. Am I, am I wrong about that? Doesn't, doesn't it get stale for you? Seriously, the same old routine every week. You know, Cena smiles, he gets booed, he gets attacked, he shrugs it off, he jumps up like he never got touched, and he wins. Is that not old for you? Seriously, man. And it's not about ripping on the dude. He's doing whatever it is that that company wants him to do. That's fine. But doesn't it get old for you? I mean, seriously. Because that's where a lot of the hate comes in for John. So what do you do? You create other top guys, guys that maybe are not quite on his level, you know what I'm saying? But guys that can sort of stand shoulder to shoulder with him and help carry the load of running a company that big in front of the masses. That's what it comes down to. Take some of the heat off John, some of the pressure to take off John, let's be honest. And it's sort of shared, okay? So they need another top guy. They needed Daniel in that role. And Daniel... I mean, he excelled in that role. He did so well. He was over the yes chance caught all, all over the planet. I mean, it was, it was such a big thing. I mean, you name it, it was such a big thing. Uh, and it's still over right now. World Series, right? Weren't they chanting yes like crazy? It's still a thing. They want Daniel. I'm going to tell you right now as a side note, when Brian comes back, it's going to be huge. That crowd, whatever crowd he comes back in front of is going to go nuts, man. They're going to pop like crazy. I'm telling you right now. And I just hope that that company is ready with a plan when he does come back to action. Because dude deserves it. He didn't ask for what happened to him. He deserves another shot at the top when he comes back. And that's the truth. So, Daniel Bryan. Okay? Number one star created by the authority. And a lot of people would argue he's the only star created by the authority. Okay? And why? Again, folks, he got over. They began to believe in him. Okay? Uh, he, he started showing signs of, of he got trashed in with the crowd. Uh, he showed signs of being able to carry the load, of carrying the pressure. Very good in the ring. Very entertaining. Became very entertaining as a character. Really did start to get over. That's why it worked. Okay? But why exactly did it work in the first place? Well, again, the heat with the authority. Because of Hunter's insistence that Daniel was a B-plus player. Remember that? Oh, God, I hate it. I despise it now. That phrase. My God in heaven, that phrase. But guess what? It worked. WWE took a real-life notion and directly applied it to the storyline. Done that before, right? Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of times they've done it. And they do it with startling success almost, almost every time. Okay? countless times and it works the authority again as we said gave birth to the rise of daniel bryan they gave him the stage on which to work and he caught fire he got over and he got over to the moon is that the lasting legacy of the authority because again folks we're counting down the days this storyline is coming to a close the, the faction as you know it we're talking about hunter and stephanie along with seth excuse me seth rollins kane uh, uh the stooges the new stooges noble and mercury right? We're seeing that come to an end. It, it's, it's on its last legs. It's, it's barely on live support right now. They're getting ready to pull the plug on the 23rd because it's time it ended. Let's just be honest. So is that the lasting legacy of the authority? We talked about evolution. The lasting evo excuse me, legacy of evolution was the creation of Batista and Randy Orton as top guys, main event stars. The lasting legacy of the authority, perhaps the creation of Daniel Bryan. Can we agree on that? Here's the problem. I would have said yes. And some part of me still says yes, but here's the issue I have. It feels as though nothing has been the same since Daniel got hurt. I mean, Brian gets hurt. He gets put on the shelf. Okay, he's out. He's no longer there. Everything changes. Okay? So... What is the company to do? What do they do? Do they disband the authority because their primary target was gone? No. There was still a lot of heat going for Hunter and Stephanie. Still a lot of, you know, anger among the fans that couldn't stand them and, and, and that desire to see them get taken down a notch. 
So what do you do? You take the focus off of Brian. You throw it on the next guy. Who's the next guy? Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns, the next top guy of the company. You know how you're really getting tired of hearing that? Guess what? It ain't going anywhere anytime soon, man. It's happening. That dude is going to be huge. Are you kidding me? You've only seen a taste of it. You've only gotten a taste of it. I mean, it, 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 he's going to get over to the moon. There's, there's nothing. He's going to be big. He's going to be huge. And what's funny is you know him right now. You see what he's capable of, but you don't even know it yet. Once the WWE corporate machine, the promotional machine, gets behind him, and I mean really gets behind him, the way they got behind John, dude, look out. It's going to be big. It's going to be massive. He's going to beat Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania 31. He's going to kick out of the F5 maybe twice. Mark my words, baby, it's going to happen. And when he does it, you will never look at Roman the same way again. He'll be on Monday Night Raw the next night. The conquering hero. the ne Not the next top guy, the top guy. All right? And all due respect to Cena, the, his time is not going to be now for very much longer. Cena's big boy. He understands how business works, okay? He also knows that, that company can't move on from him until they have a viable option to replace him. If they need a viable option to replace Hogan, they didn't find one for a long time until Austin came on board. They, they did their best with Brett and Sean, who, who did very admirably, and they made some money during that time. But they didn't make Hulk Hogan money. They didn't do that until they had Steve Austin. Then they made more than Hulk Hogan money. They made Stone Cold money, okay? Stone Cold leaves. It takes a little bit of time. A little bit of time. They get Cena. They're making John Cena money, okay? For John to no longer be considered the top dog, they got to start making some money. They're going to start making Roman Reigns money. I'm telling you, mark my words. I'm not the only guy saying this, but I truly believe this, okay? As a pro wrestling analyst, as a lifelong fan, and all the above, you just get the sense when somebody is on the eve of something big. And I truly believe if Daniel Bryan had Roman Reigns' size, the B-plus player thing would never have been introduced. There would have been no need for it because they can't argue that with Roman. You see what I'm saying? They can't argue that Roman physically can't match up, that it, he can't hold up and he can't bear the pressure. Nah, not going to happen. They could suggest it because of the injury now when he does come back. If if there's a semblance of like the authority in power on, on some level, they could always imply that Roman couldn't physically stand up. But we know the truth. Roman's a hoss, man. He's a hoss. There's not going to be any breaking down. Injuries happen. That's life. That's the reality of being a pro wrestler, being a WWE superstar. That's life. Okay? And here it is when it comes to Roman, as it pertains to Roman, the next top guy. And again, with that being the case, you got to start getting it in people's heads early. They did it with Daniel. Daniel's on the shelf. What do they do? They start moving to Roman. A little bit earlier than they wanted to. Yeah, more than likely, okay? But you got to go to your next step. Because one of your guys gets hurt, you don't close the doors and go home. You still got a crowd to entertain. You sold tickets way in advance. You have a network now. You have TV deals. You don't roll up the carpet and shut the door, dude, because Daniel Bryan's at home with a bad shoulder, bad neck. What's going on with him now? There's, he's got weakness in his arm. There's all this stuff being said about Daniel. Let me just say to you as a side note real quick, Daniel Bryan, Godspeed Daniel Bryan, okay? And full recovery, brother, and get, get yourself back to WWE because they need you, man. Fans need you. Much respect to Daniel Bryan, okay? Swear to God, much respect to Daniel Bryan. But having said all that, Daniel Bryan's a big boy as well. He knows how the business works. You got to keep trucking. You got to keep moving on, okay? So they move on to the next guy, Roman. They start getting it in people's heads at that time. Roman is becoming an enemy of the authority. He's becoming a corporate threat. He's going to have to be dealt with. Randy, you got to take Roman out. Guess what? He couldn't do it. He couldn't do it, man. He couldn't touch him. Randy Orton couldn't get the job done. Why? Because it's time for Randy to start rolling to the side just a little bit. And that means that Roman starts getting some wins. He starts getting traction. Like who? Like Daniel Bryan did, man. Start getting some traction. That's what it's all about here. And it started very earnestly. It began with the authority and Roman Reigns. And fans could see very early on that this thing was going to begin. 
and it was going to begin with Roman, and we're going to see the evolution of Roman as the next top guy. And it was all beginning with the authority, just like it began with Daniel and the authority. See where I'm going with that? So we're back on track, right? The authority has a new protagonist to aim for, to try to destroy. We're back on track, okay? Everything's good. Guess what? Roman gets hurt. Oh, no. No. <laughs> I remember seeing the news. The news flash. WWE.com. Roman Reigns is hurt. And I said, wow, dude, really? I mean, Brian's out. CM Punk has, you know, moseyed on out the door. He's gone. Now you've lost your next top guy. Not forever. Injuries happen, okay? It's all right. But you lost him for right now. WrestleMania 31, as each day goes by, it's only getting closer. The build time for WrestleMania 31 for a younger guy has to begin early. This isn't a situation with Taker versus Triple H where they show up one month ahead of time and stare at each other and look at the sign and point at it, we're ready for a match. Younger guys need more of a build-up because it has to be plausible. You have to believe that Roman Reigns can physically stand up to Brock Lesnar, that Brock will sell for him, that Roman can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him, that he can, kick, he can kick out of an F5 or 2 or 3 or whatever and get the pin on the Beast Incarnate. You have to believe that. You have to trust that that's going to be the case. The only way that's going to be believable is if the backstory has been written. If the backstory is convincing, if the backstory is full of great plot twists, if it's full of great storytelling, man... But that storytelling with Roman can't happen in a day's time, dude. It needs time. You got to cultivate him. You got to prep him. You got to keep looking at that kid every day, talking to him every day. Be sure you watch him when he turns his head during the middle of a conversation. Be sure you listen to how he's working out with the boys. Be sure you make sure that his ego stays in check because the moment his ego starts to get out of control, you're going to have to pull him back. That's reality, okay? They need Roman to stay humble. They need him to keep his feet on the ground. But they need him to realize, we're going to hand you the torch. Be ready. you got to flex. So he has to be able to do both. He has to be able to do both and handle both. Okay? And it takes a very rare breed of guy that can do that. Honestly. Austin could do it. Sean maybe did it. You know what I mean? They had so many issues with Sean, personality-wise, right? But Undertaker did it. Uh, you know, John Cena can do it. Uh, Punk did it to a certain extent. Again, issues with personality. But, again, you, you have to be sure that guy's ready. So now, all of that time, all that effort that was going to begin to prep Roman for 2015 is done because he's out. We're back to square one with the authority. What are you going to do? Tear him down? Yeah, well, you know what? Psh, why not? But guess what? No, they don't. They keep him around for target number three. Dean Ambrose. Okay? So, Dean Ambrose becomes the next guy, the next target of the authority. And it actually fits maybe a little bit better than it did with Roman because Roman's thing has always been... I'm big, I'm tough, I don't back down, bring it. Dean Ambrose's thing has always been, I'm crazy, I'll kill you, I, I, I'll kill you with your back turned. You know, I'll, I'll slit your throat when you least expect it. I'm under your bed, I'm in your closet, okay? I'm in the trunk of your car, I'll jump out at the Kmart, and I'll put you through the, fr I'll put you through the glass window at the front of the store. Because that's Dean, because he's out of his mind, man. Looney Tunes. I mean, seriously. And uh, different kind of target, different kind of feeling, different kind of storyline, different kind of storytelling with Dean Ambrose and the Authority. And it has been. It's not been the same kind of storyline. This has not been the Authority talking about Dean's B-plus player. He can't physically handle it. He's not the guy, yada, yada, yada. And then he, he can't handle it like, like, like Roman. You know, he, he's, he's just, he's big muscled up. He can't do it. He doesn't have it. They're not doing that with Dean. They're just saying, this dude's crazy. He's off his rocker. we got to get rid of him. So it becomes a little bit different focus. But Dean becomes the focus. He's the guy that becomes the target. He's got target on his back. Okay? 
So they go after him. So you could you make, all right, fine. You can make the argument that the authority is creating a new star with Dean Ambrose, that they're trying to get him to that next level, that main event level. Can we agree on that one? Seriously? I think maybe we can. We're leaving someone out here. You know who I'm talking about. The third Shield member. We've already talked about two of them. Why not throw the third guy in there, man? Seth Rollins. Was that your answer when I earlier asked what top stars, new stars the authority was creating? Seriously, was Seth your answer? Is he the the star that the authority is creating? Is that the truth? Is that the case? I mean, when you look at Seth, do you truly see a future top guy? Do you? Or has Seth been just so totally overshadowed by Randy Orton that you can't see Seth or anything than what he is, the dude carrying around the briefcase with the Jeff Hardy haircut? And as a side note, you know how sick I am of people comparing Seth to Jeff Hardy? Do you have any idea? Seth is Seth and Jeff is Jeff. Can we just leave it at that? Because physically their body types, here's, here's what it is. Their hair is similar. That's why. That's how simplistic some fans are in their view of who's who. Can I just be straight with you? It's like comparing two African-American wrestlers. Am I wrong? Well, Big E reminds me of Mark Henry. <laughs> How come Ryback can't remind you of Mark Henry? Do you see where I'm going with that? What's, what's such a simplistic view of things? Well, Seth and Jeff have the same haircut, so he's basically a new Jeff Hardy. Dude, you got to come at me a little bit, a little bit more than that. So there's the question, though. But sorry for ranting here. Back to the question, is Seth the star that the, that the authority has created? I mean, you're kind of hard-pressed to say no. I mean, he, he went from being called the architect of the shield, the guy that orchestrated the whole the whole faction and all that stuff, which, by the way, I've always found funny because Seth never struck me as being the Triple H of the group where he's like the cerebral assassin or something. I mean, it's sort of like that was sort of said and it was made to fit him instead of it sort of fitting him to begin with, which was really odd. Because sometimes, not usually, but sometimes a guy just sort of falls into the character because it's an extension of who he is. Because it's a natural fit. Is it a natural fit that Seth Rollins is the cerebral guy, the, the mastermind, the architect? Uh, eh, I don't know, dude. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know if, I, if I'm buying that at all. Do you know what I mean? But again, uh, is Randy Orton, did he overshadow Seth? I mean... Should the authority have been advertised as Seth Rollins' group? Hunter keeps calling Seth the future of the company, the future of the business. How can you call him that with Randy Orton standing two feet next to him? Now, Randy's out because they babied him out, and when he comes back, he's probably going to tear the authority straight in half if the authority's still together, which they probably won't be after the 23rd anyway. And let's be honest, Randy might even come back on the 23rd and be the guy that makes it happen. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? But was it ever really truly Seth Rollins' group? I don't think it was. And is he any closer to be considered a top main event threat now than he was when he was with the Shield or when he turned on them? When he turned on them, that was huge. It was a catalyst for a main event career, you can argue. But what's he done since then? He won Money in the Bank. Um, he's kind of just been, he's, he's beaten some names. I'm not trying to discredit anything he's done. I like him as a heel. But he's just got some big guys around him, some big talent some established talent around him you know and you know talk about other stars that maybe the authority didn't make but they elevated like the Rhodes family I mean seriously uh, uh, Goldust was sort of sitting there I, I watched Goldust on Twitter talk about a possible comeback and nothing ever really happened next thing it was back on TV due to Cody Dusty's back on TV the thing gets over like crazy Goldust looks like he's 20 years old to get in the ring. He's working lights out. So, yeah, it, it rejuvenated the Rhodes family. It didn't create new stars, but it rejuvenated the Rhodes family, got them sort of back on track, you know, a fresh take on them, a, a, new, a new reason for working together. You know, they put them on the on the circuit, man. They became workhorses. Cody and Goldust did. Goldust like, hey, I'll go along with whatever you want to do. And he's working lights out, man, next to the rookies, just tearing it up. Keeping up with everything, stamina, resiliency, dude is just off the charts, man. He still is. So yes, you can argue that they they rejuvenated the Rhodes family, that they elevated the stars of the Rhodes family. I'd buy that all day long, twice on Sunday, actually. What about the big show? 
Let's don't forget about show, okay? Show got a new lease on life. I mean, seriously. Show stepped up and manhandled Brock Lesnar. <laughs> Think about that. And and much respect to Brock, dude. I mean, after the way Brock has been running that company like he's untouchable, he's a monster. Big Show threw him around like a rag doll. Do you want to know why? Because Show deserves that. Because Show had that coming. Show deserved that moment. He needed to look like a threat. But back up a second. Big Show versus The Authority. Some people may have argued it was a little pressure. It was a little forced at times. Remember when he supposedly was fired and he came down the ring with his interest music and Titantron video playing? <laughs> what? Okay, so they kind of screwed the pooch on that one. But no, no. Let, let's be honest. Um, he got over. His career was rejuvenated, was put right back on track. Some, some would argue even more so, actually, than it ha ever had been before. I mean, show got over. I was in Charlotte the night that Big Show, that they, they had to give him his job back, and show said he had a stipulation that he wanted a WWE World title match with Randy Orton. Dude, the crowd went nuts. Show was over, man. He had been in front of the crowd two, three times that night. He was over. It was working. People, people popped off that stuff. Show's a very likable guy. Now, let's be honest here. Goldust is a very likable guy. He's, it's sort of the nostalgia factor with him. Not only can he work, but he's a fan favorite. Has been for a long time, okay? Big show, much in the same vein. So the authority had something to do with getting both those guys back over, but they both were responsible for already getting themselves there to begin with. They just needed a, a sort of a restart. You know, hit the reset button and get those guys back on track again, which is what happened. The authority facilitated that, sort of like they facilitated the beginning, the evolution of Daniel Bryan. So there's some good, right? That's good. Nothing negative about that, right? I mean, that's the authority providing some, some good stuff. I mean, you know, serving a purpose, right? A positive purpose, a, a thing to hang your hat on. That's something you could say that the authority did was that they provided that heel threat, you know what I mean? That great antagonist threat for the, the, the hero, the face, the protagonist to sort of rally the fans around and, and against and, you know, get them pumped up to see this corporate fashion get took down, which comes straight into play with the Survivor Series match that's going to take place November 23rd. Okay? Because any great antagonist can build exceptional protagonists around him due to the heat he can generate. You don't start a company with a face. You're crazy if you do. You start a company with a great heel. Okay? You want to start a pro wrestling promotion? Find yourself the best heel you possibly can and then start working on putting protagonists around him. That's my advice. Because without great villains, the hero in question would never be believable. No one would buy into it. No one would buy it for a second. Okay? The better that the, that antagonist, that villain, that heel is, the more the fans will want to see him dealt with. They want to see him get taken down and taken down hard. They want to see him fall, which is where we have come with the evolution. The evolution of the authority as that group of antagonists that people want to see fall. Okay, they want to see these guys get dealt with. This, this thing can't go on forever. You know, the NWO went on forever in a day. They lost the crowd. They still lost the crowd. Okay, but leave it to Vince McMahon to put a cap on everything. Put a time limit. He's like, he's like the timekeeper by the ring. That's him. Remember the invasion stuff with WCW? And it dragged on way too long and it wasn't really creating any new stars and Booker's awesome and DDP was kind of floating around and Bagwell was kind of eh, you know, and no one really cared. And it was kind of a hard sell because they had basically had the rookies that WCW had that WCW never gave time of day to. Then they were trying to force them down the throats of WWE fans, and they, again, didn't get in the time of day. So no one really cared, right? Remember the promo that Vince cut? I'm sick of this invasion crap. I'm sick of it. Let's stop. He's the boss, man. It's a great thing about being a boss, baby. Just pull the plug whenever you want to. What are they going to say? It's your company. WCW never had sense enough to do that. They kept this thing rolling because they thought they'd get it back on track. So they kept doing so many different incarnations of NWO and it never worked out. They did the same thing with the Horsemen back in the day. Kept trying to reinvent the Horsemen. It never worked out. 
was never the same. He can't recreate magic. Lightning cannot hit in the same place twice. And if it does, holy crap, it's amazing. But it rarely ever does. So Vincent Mann, in all his wisdom, knows how to cap this off by coming out and saying, I guess what, daughter and son-in-law, you guys don't win a Survivor Series. You're gone. Bye, see ya. And that's how you put a cap on it. That's how you make this stuff come to an end, man. That's how you wrap it up. Vince is the dude, but he's the producer by the camera with the finger going in the air. Take it home. Wrap it up. Let's go. Let's do this. You get long-winded. Take it home. So kudos to him for that. But again, we're talking about top antagonists and how you can create heroes, create protagonists around them and build those guys up. It worked. It has worked. It has a history of working. It always has. It works with the Horseman and Dusty. It worked with Evolution versus, you know, on the last days of like Evolution versus both Batista and Orton. It worked with Austin versus McMahon. It does work. Here's the kicker. One group it didn't work with. Because, again, they had a great idea, a great concept, and they screwed the pooch. Okay? I mean, bottom line, they screwed the pooch on it. Why? Because they never carried the thing out through, for, through fruition. They never found a way to wrap this thing up. They just kept on and kept on and kept on and kept on and kept on. They just never stopped. They kept on and kept on. It just never ended. Kept on. Is it annoying yet? They kept on and kept on. That's what happened. The NWO just never stopped. When they put Sting... As the top guy against NWO, Sting should have been the one to bring them down. You know how John Cena brings everybody down, right? John Cena ended uh, uh, the Nexus. Uh, John Cena ends pretty much every top heel threat that comes down the pike. All right, John Cena is going to be the one to end the authority. He'll be given the credit for it because that's what John is. He top guys what he does. Sting should have been the one to end the NWO. Instead, he joins him. <laughs> to this day, that's one of those moves that I sit back and watch and go, what? You're going to put him with the NWO? But they're the complete opposite of what he is. They 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 ruin his credibility with fans. Fans didn't trust him anymore. They they caused Stain to lose the blonde and dye it and, and go black and then, you know, wear the black and white face paint and hang out in the rafters. They caused him to become so disillusioned with himself because the crowd no longer trusted him. I mean, think about that. That's huge. And he goes and joins them. Brother, I got a whole podcast coming on the, on WCW. No kidding, man. That thing's going to be, well, it may not be that nice <laughs> if you're a diehard WCW fan. But again, I mean, Sting should have brought down the NWO and it never happened. So this falls to John Cena in this day and age to bring down the authority. And he will. He'll be given the credit because it's Team Cena. It ain't Team Orton. It's not Team Ryback, it's Team Cena. So Cena will ultimately give, be given the credit for ending the authority. He will, he has to be. He's a top guy. As the top guy, as the top protagonist, the top babyface of the company, he will be the one to end the run of the authority. He'll be given the credit for it, hands down. There's no other way it can happen, folks. All right, so back to the authority. The authority, again, as the top group of antagonists, the top heel faction of WWE has served its purpose in as much as they have been very good at what they do. There can be no denying that. They're very easily hated. They can light a fire, which can help the baby face of that particular night get over in whatever town they're in or get over on TV or for the next pay-per-view or whatever the case may be, whether it's Daniel Bryan or Dolph Ziggler or Dean Ambrose or whoever we're talking about. They serve their purpose. They know what they're doing with this group. But having said that, they dominate a lot of time. Hunter on his endless promos. And Hunter's very good. This is not a slap in the face. Hunter's very good. But a lot of time spent talking. Okay? Stephanie shrieking the yes chance. Yes! I can't even do it. It's terrible. It's almost like she can't speak anymore. But... Um, sidebar here, Stephanie to me is, it, it's, a, it's a hard sell. I don't buy it at all. And Stephanie has her fans. They love to hate her and they appreciate it. Oh, she's such a great heel. I'm sorry. I don't know if I, I don't know if I get that. You know what I mean? I don't really hate her. I, I don't really hate her at all. I just, I look at her and I go, wow, you're really trying hard to make me hate you. She keeps doing the yes chant, which was completely relevant when Daniel was there. Because they constantly took shots at it. But now that he's not there, 
Is it relevant? Is it necessary? You know what I'm saying? Is it really needed right now? Um, are they taking shots at him? You know, I, I've read and heard criticism and, and things like that from people who believe that, that the heat between um, Hunter and Daniel is real on some level, that the company truly is, uh, you know, maybe not anti-Brian, but that they, I don't know, that, that they feel the need, I guess, to, to, to keep this thing going. I, I don't know. There's nothing to, to to be had from it. When they had heat with the Bells, like with Bree, it made sense. But now it's like you're beating a dead dog. Why do you keep doing that? Do you know what I'm saying? It's like if every time they the fans still chant what, to imagine if every time they kept doing that, Hunter would stop and rip on Austin. What would be the point of that? There's no point of it. Daniel's not there to defend himself. Is that the point? <laughs> Are we all just really gullible and we don't see the point there? That's the point. It's a sort of rip on Daniel while he's not around. Is the idea that, that they're going to keep the storyline going in preparation for him to return? I mean, how much of the angle between him and them was really an angle to begin with? Does anyone really know? Is it all storyline? Okay. We talked about Hunter's promos. But here's the thing. All kidding aside. His ability to be hated... His ability to work the crowd has benefited the authorities' run. It has been the mastermind behind the authorities' run because he's the master antagonist. He's the modern-day evolution of Vince McMahon, the one that's going to carry the company forward. He's the ultimate corporate heel because it does appear as though he's sold out. Vince was the ultimate corporate heel because Vince had never been in the ring full-time as a performer, and the the notion that he was you know, uh, provided an unsafe working environment or that he was hard to work for, that he would stab you in the back every time you turn around, that he played favorites and things like that. That was all buzz that had been going on for years with Vince. You know what I'm saying? And it still is, I guess, to a certain extent with him and that company. But that that's why you could hate Vince. He's very easily hated. With Hunter, it's a different sort of hate because you look at him and you go, God, freaking sellout. And everyone's hit him with that because it's become the tagline. It's become the thing to say about Hunter, that he's the corporate sellout. And it makes sense. And I mean, if you're a baby face in that company and you come up against uh, the cor uh, North Corporation, by the way, it, isn't it great how everyone tried to, to say the authority was the second coming of the corporation? Isn't that awesome? Just because the McMahons were running it? This is how much that storyline's been done in that company. The, the, the first thing fans thought was, this corporation part two. Here it is. It's part two. No, it's not. It's not the same thing. Okay? But that, just a little sidebar there, but that's... You know, when you run up against the authority, that's one of the first things you throw at Hunter. Dude, you're a sellout. What happened to you? You traded in your sledgehammer for a laptop, man. You've gone all corporate on us. You're not the game anymore. You're not playing the game. What are you doing now? Sitting behind a desk taking notes with your tie and your suit. It's easy heat. It's so easy. Because now Hunter could be that guy saying, yeah, go do this, do that. I'm going to stand here and watch you. <laughs> Because it makes sense, and it, I mean, it works. I'm not going to dispute the fact that it works. I'm not going to dispute the fact that the authority, on the face of it, was a good idea. I just believe that it's went on a long time, and I question how good it's been from a financial standpoint, other than for Daniel Bryan. And I'm glad it worked for Daniel. Please don't misunderstand me. I love Daniel. He's the man. But after that, what what did it do besides... Every week, it's become the Hunter and Stephanie show again. And it's okay. I'm not sitting there watching it, hating it. Don't get me wrong. It's just that, you know, I see the, the, the criticism that are leveled out by fans, and I see and read and hear the things they say. And, you know, let's be honest. They they make a lot of great points. There's a lot of great points to be made um, when it comes to, you know, the authority taking up too much time the authority monopolizing monopolizing all the time and, you know, dominating the airwaves every single time WWE is on TV. It makes sense. But again, from, from the standpoint of the very beginning, it was a great idea, okay? And again, Hunter's very easily hated because he's sold out working for the man. And now he is the man, the perfect heel, the perfect heel boss because of that. So let me ask you this. At the end of the day, and again, we're talking about the end of the authority, because I firmly believe on the 23rd, this thing's all coming to a close. And WWE's going to move on with the next phase, the next top storyline. It's going to be like a SummerSlam kind of moment where you're going to see 
that next Monday Night Raw is going to start the creation of something new. Maybe the remnants of the authority evolving into something else. Maybe Vince comes back. Maybe new GMs are announced. I mean, the authority did get rid of both GMs. Why? Because when you are absolute power, you don't have subordinates that have any sort of power unless they're figureheads. And when those figureheads become an annoyance, you get rid of them. That way you can continue to rule the roost. You can continue to run the show unopposed. Because if Vicky or Brad Maddox had ever decided to get a wild hair and do something about it, they were going to be a problem, okay? Because the guys in the locker rooms, from a storyline perspective, are willing to rally behind the first guy that has the guts to stand up and oppose the authority. And they don't need that. And that in order to keep a society down, in order to keep the people down, you have to rule with as much authority as you possibly can and don't give them any hope. Just throw them a little bit here and there. Throw them a Daniel Bryan victory here and there. Just enough to keep them happy, but don't give them enough to believe that they can rise up and overcome the ruling body of the people, which is which is cannot happen because if that happens, the authority goes under, and that they can never allow that to happen in the first place, folks. All right. So the bottom line on the authority: absolute power corrupts absolutely. Can we all agree on that one at least? Uh, WWE needs. Okay. WWE feels that they need that corporate heel entity. Whether it's one guy or four guys, it doesn't make a difference. They need it. Because the company's run by the family. Because it's very realistic in terms of what the truth is. The family's in charge, and fans can buy into the notion that Steph and Hunter are power-hungry corporate types that must run the company their way, not the way the fans want. Vince is the same way. Linda could come back and do the same thing. Shane could come back and do the same thing. The grandkids are going to grow up and do the same thing, yada, yada, yada. It's the same shtick all the time. 20 years from now, a whole different set of McMahons will be running that company, and we'll all be talking about, dude, nothing ever changes with WWE. Because they feel that they can't do business any other way. Okay? That's what they, that's the model they've created from the Austin era to this point. That's the model that that company's created for top heels. More often than not, the top heels in that company aren't even in the ring. They're on the mic. You know what I'm saying? They're behind a desk. They're in the suits. They're not in the ring working matches. That's the tough part. Because there's no payoff. There could ultimately be no payoff. There could be a payoff for Triple H because he can still work. But there was never a payoff event. You'd have to have, you know, uh, corporate sponsored wrestlers like Lashley and, and Umaga. You know what I'm saying? Sponsor. Oh, well, that's the guy I picked. He's going to fight for me. I mean, that's, that's the tough one, man. That's the tough one with taking guys that are not full-time uh, uh, workers uh, and making them the primary heels or the primary baby faces. That's a tough one. Okay? But again, WWE is obsessed with that notion. They are. You have to say they are. How could you not say they are? They're obsessed with the notion of the, the ultimate corporate heel group at the front of the company being the top antagonists for the whole locker room. They're obsessed with it. They've been doing it for years. They're not going to stop now, man. What would make you think they're going to stop now? There's no indication that they're going to stop now. Honest to God, are they? No, I don't think they are, folks. It's not going to happen. When the authority goes down at Survivor Series, and I believe they will, um, at the same time, they're going to be replaced by somebody else. Are you going to get a babyface GM? Sure. A month, a month or two, three if you're lucky. Then McMahon's going to be right back in power on, on you know, character-wise on TV because they can't, they, they, they can, but they feel they can't do business without heels in charge. Because, I mean, if you think about it, especially with the heel heavyweight champion, that the babyfaces are constantly on the defense, okay? As long as the heel has the belt, there's a reason to tune in because we want to see somebody take that belt off that guy. We hate that guy. We hate Brock Lesnar. We hate CM Punk. Someone has to take that belt. We have to see it. We have to see it. See what I'm saying? Ric Flair, NWA World Champion. Get to me. He's got to lose it. He's got to hate that guy. Hate that guy. Babyface is the top champion. Where's the trauma? There's no trauma. No one cares. I mean, there's there. you care when he wins the belt, but after that, eh, I don't really care. So the same thing, if you surround and, and run WWE with, with babyface corporate types and GMs and commissioners and all that stuff, where's the drama? Because they can't be touched. There's no drama. That's why McMahon family's going to always run heel most of the time, because it works, because it gets over, because it's a formula that they feel that they can't live without. And it's tried and true. It's proven. Let's just face that, man. It's never going to go away. And look, be honest with you, you love it, don't you? I mean, as, as as annoying as it can be, sometimes it does work. You can't you can't you can't deny that. 
So the authority is going to go down Survivor Series, but they're going to re-replace. It's like trading in one demon for the next. You know what I mean? The devil you know versus the devil you're familiar with, or whatever the case may be, whoever they decided to have it. And then you're just going to have to go from there. So it, it'll end, but it'll start right back up again like nothing ever happened. That's what's going to happen after Survivor Series. So the authority will be replaced. We can agree on that, right? It's going to happen. There'll be more heels. may not be today or tomorrow or the day after or the week after. It's going to happen eventually. But the fact is that it's time to pull back a little bit. Triple H, for as much as he's done in his character, still does a lot of work behind the scenes. You can rip on the guy all you want to, but let's face it. Bruno San Martino wasn't in the Hall of Fame until Triple H took over. Sting wasn't on board until Triple H took over. NXT was just kind of sitting there and just kind of, oh, it's developmental territory. I don't really care. And now everybody cares. I mean, that has to do a lot, of course, with the promotional machine at WWE and they advertise in WWE Network and T-shirts and merch and all that stuff. But at the same time, regardless of all the exposure, who's bringing these talents in? Who's the guy giving the okay for these guys to sign these contracts? Hideo Itami, Fergal Devitt, Kevin Steen. I mean, look at all these guys. Uh, 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 Sami Zayn. I mean, you know, who's responsible for all that? Who's responsible? Okay? I mean, Hunter's been given a lot of the credit, and he should be. He's done a lot in terms of moving that company forward. NXT, again, the guys are there right now. The Shield, the Wyatt family, dude. Bray Wyatt, are you kidding me? The question is, though, whatever they do with Hunter, whatever happens to the Authority after the Survivor Series, where are they going to go from here? What will they replace the Authority with? Again, I believe it's just going to be more McMahons or it's going to be more heels and power or whatever it is. Out of the frying pan of the fire, man. <laughs> That's what we're looking at, so... But but rest is short. This thing is ending at Survivor Series. I don't often do rock solid predictions, but I would be stunned if the Authority was still in power after Survivor Series. I've already had a couple people tell me I'm crazy. That's okay. I've been told I'm crazy a lot. It's all right. I live with it. You know what I'm saying? I'm not like Dean Ambrose crazy. Don't get me wrong. I'm not in your chunk your car or anything. You know, I'm just kind of mildly crazy. I'm just sort of mildly annoying. I'm on the verge of maybe one day needing medication, but I'm not quite there yet. So <laughs> rest easy. I won't reach through the phone and do terrible things to you. Trust me. You can trust me, right? Look at the face on the phone. How are you listening to me right now? Look at that face. Look at it. It's trusting. It's awesome. It's hairy too. <laughs> but, uh, oh, by the way, uh, if you don't like spoilers, don't listen. Because depending on when you listen to this broadcast, you may or may not have watched the uh, the November 21st episode of Friday Night Smackdown. Because on that, that episode of Smackdown, uh, Triple H is going to come out, spoiler alert, uh, and announce that if Team Cena wins, all of Team Cena is fired. Wow. There is a dose of realism and an otherwise realistic storyline, huh? <laughs> terrible. Just terrible, man. I mean, it's pretty much guaranteeing that Team Cena is going over. Can we just say that? Pretty much guaranteed Team Cena is going over, right? We kind of knew it anyway, but this is just sort of the company holding up a big placard and saying, ha ha, here's the end. No reason to watch now. <laughs> so, yeah, it's not happening, man. Team Cena is going over. Absolute power. Corrupting, absolutely. That's the bottom line for me on the authority. I would love to sit here and tell you that they, they, they set, they raise the bar, that they change the game, that they, they evolve with the times, that they did something no other corporate hill groups ever done, that that Triple H with the inclusion of the rebirth of Evolution and you know the campaign against Daniel Bryan to keep Roman down, to keep Dean down, to persecute the Big Show and the Rhodes family, that all that stuff was just breaking all kinds of new ground. Um, and, 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 you know, making uh, a new headway in the business and providing moments that fans have never seen before and exciting and dramatic. Yeah, I can't really do any of that. I can't really tell you that stuff. I just can't. I'd like to. I can't. Has it been a failure? That's up for you to decide. If you're asking me personally, I don't think it was a failure because it got Brian over. It, it, it did its job in that regard, and it works. I mean, it does work on... on it, the, at the very base of it, it does work as a gimmick, okay? But the time's come. 14, 15 months of it, the time's come. It worked. It was successful in its time. But over a year later, it's time to move on. Um, it's a good time to do it. And let, all right, let, let, let's recant just a moment. If I'm wrong about Survivor Series, 
then it has to end at WrestleMania, wouldn't you think? If it can go on that long, if you can sit through more promos and more smiling and yes, yes, by Stephanie, if you can sit through all that for another four or five months, whatever it is going to be to Mania as gets here, you know, if you can handle that, then sure, tear it all down at Mania. We'll move on from there. But for me, for my money, Survivor Series is the night, November 23rd today. Let's wrap this thing up and move on to the next storyline. I'm all for it. Let's make this happen. Speaking of wrapping things up, we've reached the end of the hour, folks. That's it for me. You have listened to Episode 9, Tom Clark's Main Event. Time for some shameless plugs now. Please feel free to check out my work on BleacherReport.com, on WhatCulture.com, and, of course, the Camel Clutch blog. This has been Tom Clark's Main Event. Feel free to drop me an email, TomClarkBR at Yahoo.com. And check me out on Twitter at TomClarkBR. Don't check me out on Facebook. I'm boring and don't say much there. So... (laughs) Listen, guys, thanks for tuning in. I appreciate it. Give me some feedback. Hit me up on Twitter. Let's talk about it. Let me know how you like the show, and uh, I hope it was entertaining for you. We're going to come back and do it again real soon. I say that every time. I'm going to do better for you. You know why? Because you're awesome, and you deserve it. Give yourselves a hug. You've earned it. So <laughs> thanks again, guys. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time on Tom Clark's Main Event.